So hello, my name is Dale Jarvis. I'm the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer for Heritage NL. And this is part of our ongoing uh, COVID-19 NL oral history project. And today I have with me, Marae Egan. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. Thank you. Uh, do you want to just introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your position with the rooms and what it is that you do? Uh, well, as mentioned, my name is Mirai Egan, and I'm curator of contemporary art at the rooms, um, which which basically means that I tell stories in the art gallery space through artworks. Um, it's my job to get to know what artists are doing locally, nationally, internationally, and then to share those stories with the viewers um, through combining artworks in the space and writing the text. So, yeah, I've been, about, been at that for about 10 years now. I'm curious about how to, it's a very specific kind of position to have. How, what, was your, what was your journey to get there? How did you get started in that world? Um, I had a, an art gallery tour in grade six, and I realized that I, I love art, art gallery spaces. Um, so uh, from a very young age, I wanted to be a curator. Um, in high school, my mom pulled me up the stairs of the Buford Art Gallery. I started working at the front desk, and then I started working in the vault, um, which is haunted, by the way. And, uh, and then I saw this person who um, was talking to artists, working in the vault, doing everything that I wanted to do, enjoying free cheese plates, free wine, all that kind of stuff. And I, I thought, well, this is the job that I want um, to be a curator. So I just did everything that I could to do that. Um, went to school for it, um, worked at various um, art galleries um, around the Atlantic provinces and across Canada, and uh, ended up in Newfoundland. Um, so where, where did you study? I did my bachelor's at Mount Allison University in art history, and then I did my master's in art history as well at Concordia, so focusing on Canadian art history. Yeah, and where did you grow up? I grew up in New Brunswick, mostly, from yeah. mostly all over, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely an Atlantic kid. Yeah, yeah. And so you've been, you've been working for the past 10 years at the rooms, is that? Yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah, and have you been in the same position the whole time, or...? I was curator of Canadian art when I started and then became um, curator of contemporary art, I think 2015, that's when it happened. Right. So can you tell us, a little, what's the, like, what's one of the more recent shows that you were involved in pulling together? Um, I have my hand, uh, you know, I work behind the scenes in some instances. So for instance, we just opened an exhibition called What Carries Us, which is um, an exhibition that looks at the history of the transatlantic slave trade um, in this province. And I work with curator Bush, Busher Dene to do that. Um, but my own project that I recently, my basically like uh, what I've been working on for several years now is Future Possible, um, the art history of Newfoundland and Labrador. So this was a two-part exhibition series that um, um, wrote or tried to, that was the point, tried to write a, a comprehensive art history or tell a comprehensive art history of this place, which hadn't been written before. Um, it had taken various forms. It had been in newspaper articles and monographic publications. And um, so this exhibition, uh, it, it looked at, it went over two summers and it looked at how we, how we consider ourselves as a, a province, the stories that we tell ourselves as a province through artworks and so on. And what I'm working on currently is also this massive publication that will hopefully come out soon. Um, COVID has put a little bit of a damper on it, but this basically um, 17 authors telling different versions of, of art histories in this province. And so that will be sent out there, hopefully, to be argued with and to be built upon. So you mentioned how the current uh, COVID-19 has kind of put a, a bit of a slowdown on that. H how has it impacted your, your work? It's, uh, I think it will, to some extent, it's been nice to have a bit of a slowdown. Uh, I'll be, I'll be quite frank. Um, to catch up on, you know, with with the massive projects that I yeah, had been working on, to have that chance to slow down. But it's also um, what it has maybe not. It's forced to some extent, but a reassessment of how I operate as a curator and how the rooms operates as an institution. Um, you know, I, I've often. Um, it's, it's interesting to do a studio visit with artists through Zoom. Um, it, is, uh, it is interesting to think about what it means for an art gallery space to, to shift, really, um, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, 
to some extent to like be more outward facing in terms of digital platforms. But also, you know, one of our exhibitions that we had upcoming was entirely dedicated to touch. How are we going to navigate that? Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. But I think a, a fundamental shift is occurring in terms of how we can view the art gallery space as more of a community space. How we can, um, you know, both digitally and uh, forward moving. I'm not quite sure what that is yet. I'm still thinking about it and how my role will be with that. I'm still thinking about that too. So does that answer your question? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I even before this happened, you know, I, as someone who works in the, the realm of intangible cultural heritage, you know, I, I see a shift with some of our, our heritage partners, you know, who are working with historic sites or buildings or museums um, uh, that there is kind of this opening up or, or, or a shift in how we look at what, what the space is or, or who our audience is. Um, because a lot of the stuff that uh, I'm interested in, you know, it's, it's, it's a living, evolving thing that happens out at the community level. Um, so, you know, like I've been involved since the beginning with the Mummers Festival and the Mummers Parade. And the, the idea was always to make that a a fully participatory uh, kind of festival. When we started the Mummers Parade, people would say, oh, I can't wait to come see the parade because that's what people think a parade is. And, uh, and we're like, no, that's not, that's not how the parade works. You, you are the parade. And if you don't come, then the parade doesn't, doesn't happen, right? And I, and I think that, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, I think for museums and probably for galleries too, that that, that is, uh, kind of a, a new-ish way of thinking about how we program and how we interact with the public in, in some way. And, uh, and so, yeah, so this kind of being locked down, I think, gives us an opportunity to kind of rethink a little bit about where we're going to go next. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, the standard idea of having gatherings in terms of educational programming, in terms of um, openings, that's, that's, I don't know. I don't know how that will change, but we're not going to see that same model for um, that way of interacting within the gallery space um, for quite a while. But I, and I think that there has been a, a shift um, in terms of how art galleries do view themselves. And, you know, I see this with my experience on, on juries and Canada Council, that um, art galleries and museums are now trying to reposition themselves as places of, like that are discursive, that, that where you, you, you bring in objects um, that, um, that conversations occur around rather than telling people what to think within the space. And the, the reason that I'm bringing that um, into this conversation is um, I think that, that, like I say, like what are the different forms that that can take? And we talk about moving forward digitally. Um, yeah. I'm still, I basically, I'm just saying that I'm in a period of complete reassessment. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing yet. I'll come back in five there. years and I'll come back in five years and ask you that question again then. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, so uh, on a very practical level, um, you know, the gallery is shut down. At, at what point did you start to realize that, um, that things were shifting and that you might be looking at a, at a shutdown. Do you remember kind of what was happening in the, in the, the rooms at that time? Yeah, it, we had just opened up uh, What Carries Us and John Acumfra. Um, we had been working for two years to get uh, those exhibitions sorted because we do work several years in advance. And um, so we had our opening um, and uh, uh, very soon after we, there were, there, we had conversations as a staff about the fact that you know we would still be open for some for some time, um, but um, you know, not not to worry. And then it just it just changed so quickly. Yeah, it changed so quickly, and we were told you know it might be about two months that we'd be, we'd be closed, which felt like a lifetime, and now has passed. Um, and uh, then there was just the, the shock of just trying to just to work from home. Um, but we, like I like I say, you know we. We work several years in advance, so you know we're still maintaining the exhibition schedule that we have currently. But the shows that did open, we have pushed in um, through the summer, and hopefully people will be able to see them. Hopefully people will be able to see the shows that are out there. Group of Seven um, being one of them, what carries us, and John Comfra and Melissa Tremblett. But 
um, I, I don't know if people are going to be able to get into that space and how, how we're going to change, you know, um, people being able to access the space and numbers of people being able to access the space. Um, but as a team, you know, we continue to be working, like I say, years in advance, but there are some exhibitions that we have to completely reassess. Um, like I say, one, one exhibition that's dedicated to touch, to non-visual ways of interacting with artworks, that's, that is not probably, po that's not possible, I don't think anymore. And so we have to think about accessibility to, for people who are uh, low-sided, <laughs> Uh, for people who, yeah, I, it's, it's, a. Uh, we're going to see what happens. I'm sorry that I don't have something more concrete. <laughs> no, I deal in, in non-concrete things all the time. So <laughs> this, is the world, this is the world I'm comfortable in. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I was looking at, someone had posted an article online about how when museums specifically had shut down, there had been an immediate push to do virtual tours of museums. And then there was this huge, they had grafted out, there was this huge um, surge in searches on Google or whatever for uh, virtual tours of museums. And then, and then it immediately like it dropped off like that, that this was kind of an old idea of like how we were going to deal with, you know, having a closed space. Well, we'll just put it all on a virtual tour, but, but it became kind of apparent very quickly that that is not exactly what people were looking for. Um, so yeah, it is going to be, it's not just going to be you that it has to grapple with these things. Like I think this is going to be something that all of us are going to have to deal with, all of us who work for public institutions in some way. Like I, I rely a lot on public meetings um, and workshops and face-to-face -face interviews with people. So all of us are going to have to kind, kind of shift thinking and practice in some way. I agree. I mean, and, and one level it does allow incredible access. You know, you can watch operas online, you can have a tour of the Louvre. Uh, it's, it is, it is wonderful in that way. It is wonderful to be able to um, access conferences digitally and, and so on, but it's, it's not the same. It's, it's not the same as looking at a physical artwork. It will, um, it's not the same as seeing someone perform, being in the space, listening to music. It's not, um, you, can't, you can't mimic that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, I can understand why people would find that transition to not be as satisfactory. Um, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'll tell you the first thing I'm gonna do is I go and stand in front of a painting <laughs> in the art gallery space. <laughs> but I, I do think, and maybe this is a bit Pollyanna of me, but I do think that the benefit of, of artworks in the space is that they do change your out, outlook out, you know, outside the gallery. That you, know, you, you can have, you can go see an artwork and you can't be that experience obviously, but um, what you see in that space nevertheless affects how you interact outside uh, the space. You can't have, like Mary Pratt showed us the beauty of a, a meal being made. Monet, the quote goes, showed us the, the sunrise. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, what, I guess it's <laughs> as as you sit at home behind your screen and looking out oh. your windows. Like what what are you seeing that people are doing? Like because we obviously are seeing people who are who are maintaining levels of creativity, who are creating new works in this period. So yeah. what? Yeah, what have you seen? What have what is, what have you kind of uh, noticed that people are are doing and creating? Uh, for some people, it hasn't changed at all. I think uh, artists, by most counts, lead a pretty solitary lifestyle. Um, you know, working in the studio, making making their paintings, uh, making their artworks. A period. You, you see, you, of course, you see live stream performances um, by some individuals. But I have a friend who's a musician, and she says that she can't. She she doesn't know how to function without having an audience present. It's just not the same thing. Like this, this period is so disembodied. Um, for her, uh, and um, I can I can see that. Like on a, on a, on a more like logistical uh, framework, I'm I'm really concerned about the state of uh, of our, the art world moving forward. Um, you know, in terms of art, artists being able to sell their artworks in commercial art galleries, in terms of um, you know what this means for like you see a number of art galleries just they're closing. You, you know, it's um, 
it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's dire in some instances, and I think it's going to be dire long term. But I also see a lot of people being quite creative. And uh, I talked to my friend who's a painter, uh, and he says, you know, this this environment has turned us to some extent all into artists that we're we're forced to stop um, and spend time and to reassess and 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 also to you see a lot of creativity. Um, you know, um, being shared, and you know, by people who wouldn't normally be doing artwork. Um, so, yeah, it's a mixed. It is a mixed bag. At, at what bag. point did At what point did you and your colleagues at the rooms start thinking about um, collecting or presenting material that is being created, you know, during or in response to the the COVID pandemic? Right away. Yeah. Right away. Yeah. Um, the, the museum um, has a bit more flexibility in terms of collecting than the art gallery does. We have to run everything by our acquisitions committee, which is a, an arm's length group that approves um, and, um, artworks that are put forward by curators. Um, so they, they were a bit more, they are a bit more flexible, but yeah, right away. I mean, this is, we're, we're watching a, a major cultural shift happening and the objects that are being produced uh, it is our role as an institution to uh, to archive, to collect um, the the objects that are being produced. Um, have you seen Have you seen a, a favorite example of creativity or of, of art or craft that ha you know has uh, passed through your social media feeds? Oh, there's yeah, there's there are, there are quite a few, but those embroidery works, you know, that that everyone those that with the quotes by John Hagee beautiful beautiful because they're a little bit irreverent a little bit loving you know but they're uh they're yeah i love those yeah those yeah i'm very curious to see what will kind of uh, come out of this in terms of you know the objects that the museum is going to collect you know we're we're collecting oral histories but also uh, you know i i've had uh, several different submissions of poetry you know that people are are coming up with um there's great kind of music stuff happening as well. So yeah, it's really, there really has been a bit of a fluorescence uh, among, uh, you know, a certain kind of group of people locally. And, and that's always exciting to see. Yeah. It is. I, have you been doing anything creative? Let me interview you for a second. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm getting a lot of chores done that, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't done before, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always, uh, thinking about writing and, and research for the work that I do. So I'm, I'm still continuing with that. Um, in terms of kind of uh, create, creative, you know, work, um, I, uh, it was funny, I was having a chat this morning with my partner and, and uh, I had started to get really interested in like kind of carving, like spoon carving and whittling and that kind of stuff. And then I, and then like life got busy. And this morning we were driving, we were literally driving past a grove of trees where I've gotten some wood before. And I was like, I, sh I haven't carved anything in a while. I should, I should go take the dog and go out in the woods and get some material and then, and do that, you know, and, and, you know, it, it's not that my life has changed that much, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of was thinking today, you know, I, I kind of have that itch uh, to get out and create something. Are you making something or, or, or creating something? Um, I've been a part of this uh, performing art series online. It's like a, it's relational aesthetics and like it's come back, but it's digital and by which I mean, uh, you know, way of interacting with each other. It, but what it is, it's called performing together. And at one, it, there's a time assigned and a task assigned every day. It could be something as simple as um, uh, writing a love letter and putting it on your back or um, turning around a hundred times, but everyone, everyone, does it at the same time. So there's this uh, being alone together, doing the same act uh, performance that happens. And I mean, that, I don't think that would have happened in, or been as popular um, in any other circumstance. So, you know, it is a really like distancing time, but there's also this interesting community that has come up that I'm, I'm loving. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that every day. <laughs> the, the community has community has found a way to survive and thrive and adapt. Um, and 
I, I love seeing collaborative pieces. Like I, I don't, you've probably seen on social media, the co-video collective who have been putting out these kind of eighties tunes, which are right up my alley and, and, and all these people kind of working in isolation. Um, but yeah, it's great to see artists kind of come together and, and build a community and not just artists, but like, the sourdough bread makers or the the weavers who I've been doing a bit of work with, you know, like the weavers during this uh, of the, in the province have all kind of come together during this time. And there's a new Facebook group where they're all sharing ideas and photographs. It's really, uh, it's really, um, I don't know, kind of inspiring in a way to see that, that kind of coming together happening when everyone is at the same time more isolated. Yeah. I, I agree. It's. I mean, artists are naturally resilient. They. They. That's. That's how they operate. It. But it is. Yeah. It's. It's just a, a different idea of community that's coming out, and um, a lot, lot like there, you know, it is. A, it is a scary time. It is a depressing time for a lot of people. But I think uh, what is really inspiring is to watch how it has um, also brought out acts of care, and acts of connection. That's that's what I'm really enjoying seeing and yeah. trying to be a part of too. Yeah. I, I, one of the interviews that I did, uh, I think I mentioned to you before we started this chat was with Vicki Walsh, a textile artist who's been making masks. And she told me this great story about how she, she had been raised by her grandmother who had been born, I think in the 1890s and had been one of these women who had knit socks for soldiers during the first and second world war and had kind of inspired a love of textile work in her in her granddaughter and so now vicky was kind of saying how now she's creating textiles for a cause and she had this great kind of sense of affinity with what her grandmother had experienced in the you know early 20th century um and yeah, so it is kind of, people are making, creating linkages in this time, which always kind of fascinates, fascinates me and, and sharing stories, which is also something I love. I agree. Well, yeah. <laughs> gonna have to, we're going to have to, we're going to have to have a further chat. Um, next time you're, that. next time you're turning around a hundred times, we can, we can do a live <laughs> a live stream of it or something. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for this. It's, it's been lovely to, to have a chat. Now, if people want more information about you, the work that you personally are doing, or if they want more information on the gallery, where can they go? What are your, what are your social media feeds? Uh, well, for the rooms, of course, it's, it's at the rooms underscore NL. Um, and there is a Twitter feed for the rooms. Um, which is uh, sorry at the rooms underscore nl and uh, for me uh, just follow me on Facebook um, Mirai Egan um, or Twitter um, or Instagram you know I'm I'm on all of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are you What are you posting on Instagram these days? Um, I've actually started learning. I learned how to skateboard before this all happened as a result <laughs> of this uh, exhibition that we brought in that was about yeah, yeah. skateboard. And I, it's been a wild ride. So I've been drawing, drawing this little kind of zine of what it's been like to learn how to skateboard at the age of 37. And also what it's like to skateboard, you know, the streets of St. John's with, uh, all by myself on, on this, this new experience. So you can watch those silly little drawings. Awesome. Develop. Thank you for this. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too.